From Duke Ellington to Diana Ross and the Supremes, all the stars came out to play. The Howard Theater was Washington's Black Broadway's Carnegie Hall. But today the Howard remains closed. The Howard, in a sense, died of its own success. Will Washington's favorite show palace make a comeback? We just can't afford to lose this type of history. Next on the Howard Theater, a century of song. The Howard Theater, a century of song, is brought to you by McDonald's, rooted in the community. I'm loving it. The Howard Theater has been shuttered for more than 20 years now. Passers-by don't pay much attention to its fenced-in front doors. But soon after it opened, nearly 100 years ago, the Howard Theater became the heartbeat of black culture. I'm Robin Hamilton, and as you will discover over the next half hour, its impact lingers on here in Washington, D.C., and the world beyond. The Howard Theater was the crowning jewel of all black theaters in America. It was the biggest and it was the best. It opened in 1910 as the largest venue in the world to serve people of African descent. And it always was where the top acts went. When it first opened, uh, blacks were not able to attend uh, the white theaters uh, in Washington. They did, you know, some theater productions. Uh, there was a group out of New York called the Lafayette Players, and uh, they were one of the major black theater groups. The Howard Theater becomes really, really important as a venue it's not just a venue for entertainment, it's a venue for voice, it's a venue for pride, it's a venue for, for black aspirations, it's a venue for we are equal to anybody else in America. Some of the productions featured the players from nearby Howard University. The people who came to the Howard Theater were those who were associated with uh, Howard University and with its own um, drama. Uh, and with its own fine arts uh, department. But despite its first-class reputation, the Howard has had a bumpy financial history. In uh, 1931, uh, after a short uh, closure, it reopened and actually Duke Ellington played for three weeks straight. The big band era brought many greats, both black and white, to the Howard, featuring stars like Billy Eckstein, Count Basie, and Bob Crosby and his orchestra. In 1940, this new era was also marked by an updated look for the famed theater. They uh, converted or modernized the facade from its original Rococo revival and uh, they art decoed it. They put a coat of stucco on it and made it uh, much more simplified and changed the marquee. Soon, the Howard introduced a very popular feature that attracted audiences and would-be stars from around the country. Long before there was American Idol, you, know, you had amateur nights, and a number of major entertainers uh, got their starts there. Pearl Bailey, uh, very notably, Ella Fitzgerald, and others. But the performances most Washingtonians today remember belong to the Motown era. When all the stars came here to make their show business mark. Smokey Robinson and the Miracles had guys singing who were about my age. And so it was um, a great opportunity to go and see the people whose 45 records we danced to at the Howard Theater. Anyone uh, of those uh, stellar names that everyone knows and are household names played the Howard Theater. I knew I wasn't going to college when I didn't get into high school. I love stand-up comedy. I saw Moms Mabley there. I saw Red Fox. I saw Dick Gregory. What a great place to go. Most of the people were black, but it was hilarious and fun. He was older than his mother. <laughs> so if you were in African-American entertainment, you went to the Howard Theater. 
the 60s, more of an emphasis on R&B and major people who were, who, were, who were coming because, again, they were limited in terms of where they could appear. Many would call the late 60s and early 70s the heyday of the Howard. But even then, larger social forces began to sow the seeds of the theater's decline. The theater itself, while it's called the theater of the people, really allowed the opportunity for the races to mix and the races to get to know each other and, and appreciate each other better. By the time the late 50s come around, integration is here and consequently, black wealth left this neighborhood. And when it left this neighborhood, um, <clears throat> there was, the Howard Theater suffered as a result. Many of the theaters suffered as a result because now blacks could go to all kinds of theaters. The U Street Carter and therefore the Howard Theater uh, were greatly impacted by the riots of 1968. Uh, the businesses were looted, uh, people were afraid to come back into the center city. Um, the Howard Theater didn't have a ghost of a chance of selling tickets even for the best of performers at a time when there was so much destruction and fear. In 1974, the Howard Theater was declared a national landmark. In 1975, it reopened again with a star-studded gala that included Red Fox and Melba Moore. In the 1980s, it had a run as a go-go palace, but then it closed once more and became the property of the D.C. government and sadly fell into disrepair. It would never have been allowed to happen to uh, a white theater, to be quite honest with you, but because it was in a black neighborhood, it was in a blighted neighborhood, a neighborhood that, you know, in 1968 saw so much riot activity, it was easier to forget the Howard than to make the investment in making sure that uh, it was treasured. Up next, performers at the Howard Theater tell their stories. And we had a lot of choreography. And so we considered ourselves Howard Theater material. The Howard Theater, a century of song, is brought to you by Family Matters. lots of Washingtonians found their way to 7th and T and they have some special memories but for the dancers and musicians who played there there was nothing quite like being in the spotlight at the Howard Theater Chuck Brown he's known as the godfather of go-go a musical genre that started with him right here in Washington DC well, it's our sound DC sound and it wouldn't I, I didn't expect it to go anywhere but D.C., you know, that D.C., Maryland, Virginia, that's, that's what I was looking for. And uh, I'm very happy with it, what he did, you know, went all over the world. I used to shine shoes in front of the Howard Theater, right there on that little alleyway there. And Louis Armstrong was coming out of Cecilia's on his break, getting ready to go back into the Howard, and I waited on him and I shined his shoes. He gave me a whole dollar, and I'll never forget that. He's the only one that ever tipped me a dollar. I always told myself, I said, one day I'm going to be on that stage. And uh, it was a dream come true for me. Guitar blues legend Bobby Parker played the Howard Theater many times. Parker began his musical career with Otis Williams and the Charms. It was a doo wop band. And it was a group in a band, and very much like the Jackson Five. And we sang and danced and did, you know, tricks and whatever, you know. But then he struck out on his own, eventually playing with stars like Carlos Santana. His original song, Watch Your Step, hit the Billboard charts and was copied by everyone from the Beatles to Led Zeppelin. I've counted about 640 renditions of that ding, 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 say, whoa. Even in commercials, to this very day, they do that. In its prime, the Howard Theater provided the right atmosphere for musicians to develop their craft. Everybody would hang out, and they had little bands in there, and we'd go down there and um, party out till late, you know, and just wish the Howard was still around. Lillian Gordon danced at the Howard in the 1940s and 50s. 
back then, she was called the body. The Howard Theater was a mecca of African Americans in this city. It was Black Broadway. The lines would be all the way around, down 7th Street. This picture here, I was working with Nat King Cole. You had the pony girls, and they were like me. And they were the coarse girls. And about it, I was always the front girl. I was one of your best dancers. And in a salute to those bygone days, it's clear Lillian hasn't lost her love for dancing. Today, Celine Hilton performs with a group called Commitment. But his memories of the Howard go back to winning amateur night when he sang doo-wop with the Trojans. To go to the Howard and perform on the Howard Theater stage was the epitome because we felt like we were in the same category as the Temptations, Impressions, and all the other artists that performed on stage there. To win the talent show at the Howard, I feel like that was the tops for me as a local artist. Another member of the Trojans, Jimmy Dugans, considered The Temptations his favorite group. The particular song that I remember was uh, um, The Girls Are Right With Me. That was one of the songs that the, uh, that the Trojans did in our show. And uh, Get Ready. <laughs> Jimmy liked The Temptations so much, he styled himself after their lead singer, Eddie Kendricks. I just listened to his records and just studied and studied and studied. His diction, uh, the way how he phrased his, song, his lyrics and his songs, I just studied him. Eventually, Jimmy became part of the Young Senators, Kendricks' backup group on the road. And they composed a song called Seventh and T. I say the Howard Theater was a stepping stone that led me to where I am today. Coming up, how the Howard Theater changed the lives of its fans forever. Certainly it influenced my career choices. I saw black people in their glory. The Howard Theater, a century of song, is brought to you by the Virginia Lottery. the Howard Theater looks like just another empty show place. But as we found out, it lives on in the hearts and minds of everyday Washingtonians. In one way or another, the Howard Theater changed their lives. One of the most interesting groups to play the Howard Theater was the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, graduates of the Piney Woods Country Life School. This all-woman, ethnically diverse orchestra often headlined. It was interesting because Billie Holiday was actually the halftime entertainment for the International Sweethearts of Rhythm. Kathy Hughes because knows all about the Sweethearts. Her mom was one show. of the group's founders. The first theater that I have any recollection of was the Howard Theater sitting on the front row. At the Howard, they'd be standing all around the corner whenever we played, yeah. Today, Kathy Hughes heads a radio empire, a career inspired by her life and times at the Howard, a place she still misses. The absence of the Howard Theater creates a serious void in that 7th and T area, and it's like having a hole in your soul. Linda Lou McCall was a serious student at Howard University when she first went to the Howard Theater back in 1969. My parents, in spite of my majoring in theater, thought I was going to work for the government. Once those curtains opened, it was over. While I was at the Howard, I, um, me and my two girlfriends were hired by the Delphonics to travel with them as their photographer. <laughs> By the late 1970s, Linda was doing nearly everything behind the scenes for her husband's band, Confunction. Everything from writing songs, doing their lighting, helping them with their costuming. I did album covers. I was a production assistant on nine of their 11 albums. Later, she was hired by MC Hammer. She's been earning gold and platinum records since 1978. 
In the 1990s, she helped launch rap artists like Eminem. One of her original songs is sampled on a Lil Wayne CD. I say I had a pretty good ride. It, it, I mean, it was, it was a fabulous ride. It was a rare thing, and I, it was very exciting for me. For years, Cecilia's was the hot spot in the 7th and T neighborhood. Tina Scott Boyd's mom owned the bar, and she remembers growing up close to the stage door. I saw all, all the shows, every show. Um, that was a real treat for me. That time it was the Motown era, pretty much. Um, Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, the Four Tops, the Supremes, the Marvelettes, uh, Martha Reeves and the Vandellas. I mean, every week it was a show. And James Brown used to always do something special. He would have a show for the kids at 10 o'clock on Saturday mornings, and the line would be wrapped around the, the building. And, you know, a lot of the entertainers, they would come over to my mother's bar, restaurant, you know, after the last show. And it was just fun times. James Brown was very fond of my mother. <laughs> and uh, Red Fox was a character. So they really stick out in my head. Back then, I didn't really appreciate the experience, and I took a lot of it for granted because it was just part of my normal life. But now looking back, I, I was so privileged to having grown up here at 7th and T. I hope that we're able to revive the Howard Theater and continue the string of pearls, if you will, from the Lincoln Theater down to the Howard Theater. When we come back, what lies ahead for the Howard Theater. We're trying to create a true cultural destination where people can go and get a true sense and flavor of D.C. The Howard Theater, a century of song, is brought to you by McDonald's, rooted in the community. I'm loving it. Looking at the Howard Theater now, it's hard to imagine its glory days as the crown jewel of the Chitlin Circuit. But there's more to this drama than reliving the past. If some local developers have their way, this once spectacular entertainment palace will soon have a dazzling encore. As this time-lapse video shows, lately someone's been rewriting the script on the Howard. It's getting a facelift, and underneath all that old stucco makeup, is the window to the future. What we've done recently is taken off the facade that was from 1940, um, which reveals the actual original 1910 facade. The Howard sign will end up being over on this corner here, where it originally was. For Chip Ellis, it's been seven years since he started planning a mixed-use development in this Shaw neighborhood. It didn't take him long to realize the Howard had to play a significant role. This has been dormant, unfortunately, for the last 25, 30 years. But our plan is to bring back the Howard Theater. Restoring the Howard meant casting a team of experts. So Ellis asked the firm of Martinez and Johnson to help him raise the curtains again. It is a tremendous icon in the world of historic theaters. But for Washington, D.C., it was also a very, very important social destination. But if the exteriors seem to set the stage for success, the interior of the Howard held an unexpected plot twist. I think there are probably some theaters that are in worse condition than the Howard, but I don't know that we've run into them. Uh, I have to say, it's, uh, the basic building is very sound, so the bones of the theater are great. A failing economy also thickened the plot, and after several false comebacks, some wondered if the timing for the Howard's second act was on cue. We look at it as an opportunity. You know, the construction is lower now, so you find a lot of uh, construction companies that are hungrier for your business. You find uh, that you get a lot more uh, attention to detail at this time, and so we feel it's a good time to do it while the market is at a low. Now, with the video screens, um how are we to address and border the various and I think we have a real commitment of the District of Columbia to pull this off. Despite the crumbling interior, this is one area of the old Howard that will be preserved. Here, in what used to be the green room, 
you can still find autographs of great black artists like Ray Charles and B.B. King on the walls. The revitalized Howard Theater won't be a solo act. Instead, supporting players like a music center and a museum will add to the show. It will really be a place where people can learn about the history of the Howard and understand what its connection is, not only to historical music, but to contemporary music. And the Howard's rich tradition of cultivating careers in music will get a reprise in an education center located behind the theater. So that artists can take chances again, that they have a venue where they can go and really create and try different types of music and, and create their own genres. And we're going to have um, opportunities for different events that will have almost restaurant-like quality to the experience in addition to the performance. We're building this for the next hundred years, that this will be a truly dynamic, flexible facility. What keeps me going every day is that we are preserving history. That's what drives me every day. The Howard Theater will celebrate its 100th birthday on August 22nd. The development team plans to cap off the theater's comeback with a black tie, red carpet evening. I'm Robin Hamilton, and I hope to see you soon at the corner of 7th and T.